Hey guys, I'm Jen Wright, and this is my demonstration for Souk Fine Arts 2021. It's an oil painting on an acrylic stained background, and part of what I was aiming for here was a bit of contrast between the styles of painting, between the more sort of um, buttery, loose oils and the thin stained acrylics. Uh, I'm going to take you step by step through the entire process. I, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for joining me. So, where does a painting come from? Well, when a canvas and a brush love each other very much, sometimes they make a painting together. Actually, for me, ideas come from my life. I do a lot of equestrian pieces, and that's in part because I'm surrounded by horses. I live on a farm, and I look after horses for my full-time day job. These are two of the horses I take care of. Carlo is my boss's Grand Prix dressage horse, and I've painted him a few times, and I have a sculpture in the works as well. He's super expressive, and he has that fantastic, unusual Roman nose. Initially, I was planning a painting of him on his own. I was thinking of something white on white to really make his form and structure the point of the painting. And to that end, I kept taking pictures of him for months. But none of them really grabbed me and made me like need to paint them. But what I did keep seeing was how deep his relationship with his friend Pharaoh was growing. In particular, I loved seeing that every time they're turned out together, they start to scratch each other's backs. So I changed the plan and turned them out one evening during the evening light for pictures. I really liked the symmetry, the monochromatic color scheme of the two greys, and the happiness of their simple enjoyment of each other. I felt like it was something worth painting both visually and emotionally. I'm always looking for imagery that will communicate, and my hope from this one is that you can feel their camaraderie. So let's get into the details. So I'm stretching my own canvas and what I'm using there is a really fine portrait canvas which has a, a tighter grain than standard canvas and that's going to be really nice for the staining process that happens next. It will allow the medium and the water to run over it um, just a little bit more easily, but you can use anything. This is a clear gesso. I chose that because I wanted the color of the canvas to show through including all of its little irregularities. And then the stain itself is acrylic paint with a fair bit of medium and even more water so that it runs nicely down the canvas. And I was just prepared to play with it, to see what happens, to watch how the different colors intermingle as they move down the canvas, and just uh, do it in a bunch of layers. The first layer obviously is wet into wet, but acrylics do dry quickly, so soon you're working over top of areas that are almost dry. And I just really enjoyed what the colors do this is where you get to um, kind of co-create with the paint. It's not going to do exactly what you want it to do. I wanted some darker values as well, so that's where the blue comes in. That's probably a Prussian blue, and I think most of the red here is alizarin crimson, but I know that I picked up a few other things as I went along. And now it's time for the block-in. This is, to my mind, the most important part of the whole process, although it might be the most boring for you to watch. Uh, what I'm doing is I've got in my left hand the picture that you can see in the corner here, which is the picture we're drawing, and I am making measurements with my eyeballs. So I'm asking myself, is his shoulder um, the same distance from his bum as his nose is from his shoulder? Is his you know, how, how far down do his feet go here? And I'm just measuring things against other things. And so gradually, as you get more sure of where you've made, where you've put the placement of little landmarks, then you can get more sure of the ones that you measure off of them. It's, um, it's a bit of a give and take. You're not absolutely sure of each mark as you make it, but you get more and more sure as you tighten it up. There you can probably see where I lowered the belly an inch because I realized I had it too high. So in editing, this looks like it took no time at all. This is hours, many hours of walking back and forth, stepping back and taking a look at what you've got. So here's the finished block in and I've actually already started to um, gently put in some of the shadows so that I can see the horses.
I should also, also mention that we're still in acrylic paint at this point. So I'm just starting to add um, a few of the lights and darks so I can start to see the horses and start to solidify in my mind what I'm doing. Um, my original plan was for a fair bit of the background to show through, so I just wanted to kind of lightly sketch in the horses and see what I'm seeing and see if I like it. And this is my little helper, Razzie. A little bit of fur in the paint is maybe the secret ingredient to everything, hey? This is a scumble. So I felt like the background is maybe a little bit too strident and I wanted it to be soft. So I'm using just a regular old dish sponge, but making sure there's no detergent in it. And um, a scumble is when you add um, a lighter veil or glaze over top of what you've already done, where a glaze is something that's a little bit darker and we'd use that more to color things in or to give an overall color to an area. Um, this, is, uh, this is sort of almost adding a sheer curtain over top of everything. I just want it all to be a little bit softer. And I want to warm up the area that's going to be the focal point. I'm thinking that Carlo's head, which is the head on the left, should be the focal point. So I'm really warming that area up compared to everything else, making it, uh, making it stand out, giving it some difference. And this is the start of the oil paint. This is the fun part. So I'm just grabbing a few of the obvious highlights just to give myself a map of what I'm looking at. I need to start thinking, how light am I going to get? It's tough when you're painting a white or gray object because you always want to paint it lighter than it really is. There are in fact no actual whites on a white horse. Um, I mean, unless it's standing in direct sunlight and there's some highlights shining right off of something. But uh, these guys are not in that situation. Yes, they're in direct sunlight, but as you can see, it's not white. So I'm describing the shadow shapes to myself here. Again, because this is sped up, it looks, um, it looks simple. But what I'm really doing is looking at the picture and asking myself, okay, how far does this shadow go? And what does it bump in into? How long is it? How wide is it? What shape is it? You can't think of the horse. You have to think of the shapes that you're looking at. And then once in a while you stand up and stand back and uh, look and make sure that it is looking like the horse. But in the moment, you want to think, what shape is this? I'm putting in all the darks first because it'll be easier to paint the lights into them, and some of the lights, including his mane, go right over top of some of these darks. So it's nice to get those in there first. And I want this to be a pretty loose painting, so I'm not I'm not going to work into small brushes, I'm not going to overly adjust my brush strokes, I want them visible. Um, I don't always work that way, if you look through my work quite a bit of it is not that way, but on this one it's a big painting, I wanted the brush strokes to have some, some um, visibleness, I wanted them to be fun. So I probably won't take this horse's head much beyond this initial layer, where normally I would do quite a few layers. So this is a wet in wet technique. Some people would call it a la prima, which means all at once. So you paint it all in one sitting while the paint is still wet, and you can work uh, the lights into the darks. I'm going to do the same on Pharaoh's head, making the shadow shapes. It's all going to start to feel familiar to you pretty quick here. One of the reasons to start with the shadow shapes is that they're what defines the form. All that we can see with our eye is how light passes over an object, and one of the very first clues your brain has to what the shape of the object is, is what the shadows look like. So it really does help you interpret the form if you do the shadows first. There are no rules in painting, so don't take that as a rule, that's just a suggestion. That's one way of going at it, and it will allow you to see what you're doing quickly, and it will allow you to see your mistakes quickly, because you'll go, ow, oh, that form doesn't look quite right. A little bit tougher on his torso, because it's a, a large area, lots of uh, muscle and fat that doesn't produce a whole lot of 
crisp edges that make shadows. I'm gonna make sure there's a little bit of detail up here near his head, because those are some of the more fun areas to look at. Bust out a bigger brush there. oil paints is you can blend as much as you want. If you're working all in one day, they'll generally stay open or wet for you, so you can just keep on working, which is really nice. If this was acrylics, that wouldn't be the case. I'd have to um, put down what I intended to put down and live with it. With oils, you can keep on adjusting. And that's one reason that I used oils for the body, as opposed to the acrylics on the background. He's got a nice sort of naturally wavy tail and the light was catching it, so these are just those little bits. And I'm kind of dry brushing those in, meaning, um, meaning that there's more, not that much paint on the brush. And when you drag it across the surface, especially a little bit sideways like that, you can get kind of a glimmering or shimmering effect. And that can be a lot of fun to add highlights with. So I'm calling this done at this point. I've finished painting the horses. And I've actually painted them more than I originally planned. Originally I thought that a fair bit of the background would be showing through, but the more that I painted them, the more I wanted to, and, and this is how it turned out. Paintings are often a surprise, and I actually think that's one of the reasons to do it. You don't know where you're going to end up, so it's a fun ride. I've still left the front legs of the back horse fairly ghostly, I thought it could get pretty confusing if all those legs were thoroughly painted, and this way there's some sense of what's in front of what. So they're sort of suggested more than anything else. Same a little bit with his back end here. I didn't want... It's easy, it's easy on a horse for the legs to become the center of attention, because that's where most of the detail is on a horse, and it's important to me that your eye is drawn to the faces in this case. So I went a little easy on the legs. I'm really enjoying the background. I liked what happened with the stain and the, the trickles and the way that the colors intermingled. So thanks for coming along for the ride on this one. Thanks for watching this demonstration and once again I want to say that I'm super grateful to Souk Fine Arts for having a digital show again this year. It's the second year of COVID. Most of the other art shows have cancelled again and I'm really grateful to still have a place to show my work, even if it's virtual. They've done an outstanding job of making a pivot here. So thanks everybody, and uh, thanks again for watching my demonstration. I just have a few final thoughts before, before we finish this demonstration. I normally demonstrate in person. I've been uh, demonstrating at art shows for a little over 20 years, both sculpture and painting. And I, I've really noticed a pattern. Most people, they come by my table for a couple minutes, maybe ask a few questions, and then they're on their way. But there's always a few people who hang out for ages, and maybe even the whole demonstration. And when I get to talking to them, what I notice is that most of them wish they were doing art, but they're not. And if you're that person, since we can't do live, demonstration, live demonstrations right now, I still wanted to have that conversation. What I notice over and over is there are two things that stop people from doing the art they want to do. Time and fear. And time really sucks, I know that. I have a full-time job, I have plenty of obligations and I don't get in nearly the time painting and sculpting that I wish I could. And particularly this painting really brings that home for me because I've been sick for um, almost the entirety of the last year. I had some surgery, now I'm nearly 100% again, but it was particularly painful not being able 
to pursue the creative side of my life, to, to just prioritize my work. And I'm sure that sounds pretty familiar to most of you. That's, that's what we have to do, right? So in terms of time, what I would say is set a timer for 20 minutes every day. Get yourself some cheap materials. You do not need high-end materials to get started. There's student grade paints, there's dollar store paints, there's a pencil and paper and it. It doesn't need to be, you know, 100% cotton rag paper. Just start with anything you can get your hands on. The joy of art is it's not expensive. This is not like skiing or riding horses. This is a, a, a cheap hobby to start. And give yourself a little bit of time every day. I think that counts at first to just make it plain to the creative part of you that you're acknowledging it, that you're taking it seriously, that you're prioritizing it a little bit, that its dreams aren't frivolous because we spend a whole lot of our lives putting the creative things aside in favor of what has to be done. I would say for a little while decide that your creative stuff has to be done just 20 minutes a day, it makes a huge difference. And if you want help, there are fantastic teachers in every town. We have McTavish Academy of Art, Vancouver Island School of Art, and a ton of artists are happy to do um, private teaching and private mentorships. So, you know, look around, ask your local art societies. There's tons of help. And I've found that by and large, the arts community is warm. It's, um, it's a community. It, it, it's not competitive. It's usually a warm place. So I would say jump in and, and meet people and give it a shot. The other side of the coin is fear. I think that's more important than the time component even. Um, I wish I could say that the fear goes away. It doesn't. You just learn to paint anyway. If you're scared of um, your work being crappy, people not liking it, um, needing to have talent and thinking that you have none. I think talent's a bit of a myth anyway. I think what you have to learn is that none of those matter compared to starving yourself of having a creative life. Being creative to me is the reason to get up in the morning. It's the reason to bother. Um, it certainly isn't your day job and it certainly isn't uh, shopping for groceries, you know? It, it's, um, the reason to carry on is that there might be another cool project ahead, at least in my mind. So the fear is worth working with. It doesn't get better. You just press on and learn to enjoy the part that you enjoy and learn that the fear is part of it. That's, that's how you know it matters to you. That is a signal that you're doing something that's actually important in your own mind if it scares you. So do it anyway. That, that's all I can say about that. Do it anyway. And I've talked to lots of artists, writers, anyone creative. Uh, it's common to all creatives. It, it's, just, it's just the water we swim in. You got to get used to it. So again, don't let it stop you. Time and fear, those are your two monsters that you've got to handle. And if you are watching art demonstrations like this, I know you want to do this. So this is my combination encouragement and kick in the ass. Take uh, however much of either of those that you need and please prioritize your own creativity a little bit. I hope that I get to see you live soon. I hope that, uh, that we're back at art shows soon and I get to be having these as conversations and not talking to a camera. Um, yeah. Hopefully next year, we're actually doing live demos again and I can meet some of you in person and you can tell me that you picked up the brush. That would be really cool. So good luck, do it. And in the meantime, take really good care of yourself. Thanks everybody.